Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephra, PA, 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. Greetings, dear young people. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you again for that singing. The inspiration of it. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Oh Lord, we we love you. We tremble before you. We bow down to you. We honor you. Please help us this morning, Lord. We have so much to see today, Father. Please help us open our eyes, Father. All of us. From the depths of our heart, we cry to you this morning that you would open our eyes, Lord. Wash me in the blood, the blood of Jesus, O oh God. You know me, you know my fears, you know this fearful, insecure man, O oh God. And fill me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. The beautiful influence of a godly home. The beautiful influence of a godly home. That's our title this morning. I'm going to be a biblical idealist this morning. I've been laying the groundwork the last two days. So that I could say what needs to be said today. So I'm going to be a biblical idealist. Would you allow me to do that this morning? Come and dream with me, young people. Holy dreams and beautiful stories of righteous homes. Come, let us soar together to the highest places that the precepts of God's Word can take you. <clears throat> Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And Habakkuk said these words. God said them to Habakkuk. Write the vision, Habakkuk. 
and make it plain that they may run that readeth it. The influence, the beautiful influence of a godly home. There is something very precious to behold when God brings a dedicated couple together in holy matrimony. I'm sure that you cannot understand it from my perspective, but I know that you understand it. I know that many of you have been to weddings like that and you knew, you knew in your heart what kind of couple this was that God was joining together. But oh, from the perspective of a pastor, a preacher, you can't understand the beauty to behold God bringing a dedicated couple together in holy matrimony. A young man, he's been soundly converted without a question. He has come to the place in his heart, in his life, where all is clear. He's come to that place where he has personally crowned the Lord Jesus Christ as the king of his life. A young man who didn't stop there at crowning him the king, but from there he learned to walk with God. Yes, the young man learned to walk with God. He begins to walk in obedience to God and to His Word. And you know that he has gotten a blessing from God for himself. You know it. And his life is filled with purpose, with God's purpose. And God brings a young man like that together with a young lady who also is in the same state. She has done the same thing. She is dedicated to God. She is walking with God. You can tell it by the glow that is on her face. She has gotten her own blessing from God. And her eye is single upon God. All that see him and all that see her, they shall say that he is the seed which the Lord hath blessed. Isaiah 61. All that see her shall say that is one that the Lord hath put his blessing on. You say, Brother Denny, all that before marriage? Amen. But dear young people, this is the Christian life, friend. This is the Christian life. Yes, all that before marriage. Most of you young people, as you sit here today, you have blessings on you because your parents have given themselves to God. As you sit here today, you're blessed. God has blessed you after your parents. The Bible teaches that it will be that way. I've studied this transferal of the blessings from the parents to the child. And it's a beautiful thing to behold in the Scripture. And I, as a parent, I take much responsibility as I realize 
that I have a lot to do with the blessing that God puts upon my children. And as you sit here today, young people, you are blessed. You are blessed after your parents. And it's beautiful. And I'm so glad that it is that way with most of you. But there comes a point in time, a place in time, when you must get your own blessing, young people. It's not enough to have the blessing that God has placed upon you because of the parents that He gave you, because of the home where you grew up. But there must come a point in time when you get your own blessing from God. And all will know, yes, there is grace upon her and there's no question about it. And all will know, the hand of the Lord is upon that young man. Young people, some of you are hitchhiking this morning. You are hitchhiking on mom and dad's blessing. It's time to get off the train and get your own. Let's read in Psalm 78 just a little bit. In Psalm 78 and verse 1 through 7, we see this blessing... We see God's design, God's wisdom, God's plan for this blessing and how it is passed on from one generation to the next. God says in verse 1, Give ear, O my people, give ear. Give ear to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. And I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, or from the children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, and His strength, and His wonderful works that He hath done. You see those three beautiful things? The praises of the Lord and His strength and the wonderful works which He has done. We will not hide them from our children. For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed the law in Israel which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them even the children which should be born who should arise and declare them to their children, that they, that last group of children, might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Now there we see God has a beautiful plan of bringing a blessing upon the children, but also that that blessing that is brought upon one generation, God has a plan for that blessing to be transferred on to the next generation. And in this sense here, I believe in the second blessing. And some of you young people have only got one. You live here under the blessing of your parents. You're here today. Your life has been sanctified by their love and their dedication to God. But it's time that you get the second blessing, young people, the blessing that God gives to you personally as you begin to deal with God on a personal basis. As God becomes your God, your living God, blessings come down upon you and young people. It's mentioning three generations here at least and possibly even four, but Young people, the generation to come is not going to get the blessing unless you get the blessing. They will not get it. 
You must experience the praises of the Lord, the strength of the Lord, and the mighty works of God so that you can pass it on to the next generation. It's thrilling when God does this in a couple's life. He brings them together in holy matrimony. They've had a beautiful and a pure and a holy courtship. There they stand, so full of holy desires, so wanting to please God, so married to Christ, so much in love with Jesus, the eyes of their hearts so fixed upon God. And here they find themselves having been led by God together in holy matrimony. There's something beautiful about that, young people. That couple, they have the potential to have a home that is filled with love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. They have the potential to have a home that is bound together by God Himself. The threefold cord is not easily broken. They have the potential to have a home with a powerful unity and oneness in it. They have the potential to have a home with unhindered prayer in it. They have the potential to have a home, young people, where there has never been an argument. where there's never been an argument. Do you believe that you could have a home, a marriage, where there's never been an argument? That's what Hudson Taylor said about his home that he grew up in. He said there was never an argument in our home. I've heard many testimonies like that. I heard the testimony of a sister who said there were 14 children in our home. But I can testify today that I never heard and I never saw my father and mother have an argument all my days. This couple has the potential to have a home like that. Young people, set your sights on this. Set your sights on this kind of a home, on this kind of a marriage. Don't go by what you see with these eyes around you, but you go by what you see with the eyes of your heart as you look into the pages of this blessed book, which is the Word of God. You go by what you see with the eyes in your heart. Don't be discouraged by what you see with the eyes that are in your head. You go by what you see with the eyes of your heart. Now, how does a beautiful marriage like this affect the children? How does it affect the children? Let's read in Malachi. Malachi chapter 2. Here we find a great secret in Malachi chapter 2. And we're going to read verse 15 and 16. And God is dealing with the need of unfaithfulness in the marriages of the people of God. God is dealing with the treacherous dealings of the men of Israel with the wives of their youth. God is dealing with divorce. And may I say, with the spirit of divorce here in Malachi chapter 2. In verse 15, God says these words. 
And did not he, God, make them one? Did not he, God, in the beginning, in the garden, did not he make them one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? Or, and why did God make the two one? Why did God perform a mysterious binding, gluing of two people and made them one? Why did God do that? That he might seek a godly seed. That he might seek a godly seed. Seed. Therefore, and we want to recognize why the therefore is there. Therefore, says God, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord. The God of Israel saith that he hateth putting away. He hateth putting away. Now here in these verses we have a secret. God reveals a secret to us. One of the reasons that he has provided a powerful, mysterious union of husband and wife. And it is mysterious, and it is powerful. But one of the reasons why God has done this is because God is jealous over the seed, the offspring that comes from that union. He is jealous over the seed. He wants a godly seed. And that powerful, mysterious union, young people, influences and produces a godly seed, a sanctified seed, a seed for God, a seed who will proclaim His name. And that's what God is concerned about. He's very jealous over the seed the offspring of the union that he might have a seed who will proclaim his name. Oh, the devastation of divorce. How it pollutes the seed for God. And may I say, oh, also the devastation of the spirit of divorce. How it hinders the passing on of this blessing from one generation to the next. And I know probably every one of you in this room, you know that God is against divorce. But may I lift your sights just a little bit higher this morning. That your heart will also say, along with saying, I will never get a divorce. May your heart also say, I will never allow the spirit of divorce in my marriage. Yes. And in my home. You see, young people, we need to see the value of a child. The high, high, high value of a child. We begin to get a glimpse of it, even looking here in Malachi. God has focused in on this child, on these children which come from this union of a husband and a wife. God has focused in on it. God has placed a very high value on the children, God has done that. We need to see the child as God sees it. 
And I believe that this kind of couple that we described to you a few minutes ago will also have a high value for the children that God would give them. We need to have a high value of the child. It is not. I like babies. I mean, that's okay. But it's more than that. It is not. Won't this be fun to have our own household? Now, that's okay. But it's more than that. It is not, young people. Won't it be neat to be a father or a mother? It is not that, young people. That's okay. But it's higher than that. It's higher. We need to see deeper than this. We need to lift our eyes up higher. And somehow be able to see that with your hands holding that little baby and your eyes looking up unto the God who gave that baby, you realize that this is a gift from God. The God that I see with the eyes of my heart has given me this baby. You need to realize it is a seed for God. A soldier for my king. Young ladies, please. Young ladies, please. A soldier for my king. An eternal soul that will live forever and ever and ever. A temple for God to dwell in. An instrument in which my glorious God can work out his purposes on earth for his glory. That's what I have in my hands. We need to see the high, high, high value of the child that God puts in our hands. Oh God, open our eyes to see that. Now it is beautiful to see the potential value of this child. It is. And we must begin there. There must be that awe that has settled down upon us. And I assure you, young people, if and when that day appears in your life that you find yourself holding that little baby in your hands, there will be an awe that comes over you. But I believe that you can deepen the awe that comes over you by your understanding of how God sees that little baby. And that's something you can prepare ahead of time. It is an awesome thing. But oh, for the depth of seeing what you have in your hands. From God's perspective. And that's a beautiful thing to see that potential value. But how do you bring this child to the place where God can take him up and use him? How do you do that? The child comes to us as an innocent baby. A sinner, no doubt. And you'll find that out very fast. But nevertheless, an innocent baby, open, blank, a mind that is empty, nothing has been written on it, 
no experience at all. Even their body has not been trained in evil yet. The child comes to us that way. How do we move from this sweet little baby to a soldier in the army of the Lord of hosts? And see, young people, somehow we need to be able to see both of those at the same time. A sweet little baby that God has put in my hands and yet a soldier for the Lord of hosts. This is what God has given me and this is where I'm going with it. Now God has revealed in the scriptures a set of holy methods. By which you can take this sweet little baby from that place to the place where you have a soldier who wants to live for God all the days of his or her life. God has revealed in the scriptures holy methods that you can follow to bring that to pass. And they work, young people. They work. Don't you doubt it. They work. Don't you overreact at maybe some failure in some of those things. They work. I like to call it the holy art of raising children. And I call it an art because there are principles which work together. You know, just like in any art, there are principles and they all work together. I call it a holy art because they are principles that can be learned, studied and learned. I call it a holy art because these principles in the word of God are disciplines, disciplines not for the children, but for the parents. They are disciplines for the parents. They are the sculpture who is going to make this statue. So they are the ones, the parents, who must practice the disciplines to mold the character of this child. And I call it the holy art of raising children because many people have gone about it in a very haphazard way and no artist would ever produce anything worth anything if they did it in a haphazard way. We must learn these principles, young people. We must study them. We must search for them with all of our heart. You do not have to enter into marriage and home life unprepared. I don't believe it's God's will for you to enter into marriage and home life and not know what you're doing. Even though many of your parents would say, we didn't have a clue. And we didn't have a clue. We didn't have a clue. But it doesn't have to be that way with you young people. Because it's all written in this book. But they need to be searched out and studied and learned and pondered. And engrafted inside of your heart. So that when you face that day, you will know what to do. There is one thing that prevails over all of the rest of these methods, and you must have it, young people. One thing which prevails over all the rest of these methods, which, as I told you, we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at. We are going down deeper than the methods this week and looking 
at the vision which God has revealed in His Word for you, for your homes, for your children, for the generations that will come forth from you. That's where we're at this week. You get that, you go here and get the nuts and bolts yourself. I hope you will. But there's one thing that prevails over all the rest of these methods. As this couple comes together to establish a home, this dedication, this unity, this love for God and love for each other, it creates a powerful atmosphere in their home. A powerful atmosphere. And who do you suppose gets the blessing and the benefit of that powerful atmosphere? How does this work? I want, I want to look in Isaiah just a bit. Let us turn there. Isaiah 44. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3 and 4, we find a principle, a promise, power in these verses which have never failed, young people. This principle that we're going to look at, the promise that goes along with the principle, and the power which is the effect of the principle have never failed. You can count on it. They have never failed. Isaiah 44 and verse 3 says, For God speaking, I, God, will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods Upon the dry ground, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they, thine offspring, shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water course. Now, first of all, let's look at the principle God says here, I'm giving you a principle this morning. I, God, will pour water on him who is thirsty. And the principle is thirst. Now, let me ask you, young people, is God talking about a drink of water here, like I have a drink of water here in my hand, is that what God is speaking about? Is God saying, I want to assure all of you, my people, that when you get thirsty, I'll make sure you have a, some water to drink? Is God saying that? No. You all know that, and you're, none of you are theologians, but you know that. No, He's not talking about a drink of water. He's talking about the water of His Spirit. How many would agree with that? Thank you. So now God is giving us a principle. And the principle is the principle of thirst. Those who are thirsty, they will, without fail, they will get a drink from God. And not just a drink. God doesn't say, I'll give you a little drink. He says, I'm going to dump a bucket on you. When you're thirsty. And that brings us to the promise. God promises. When you are thirsty, young people, God promises. I will pour water upon him who is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Are you thirsty, young people? Do we even know what it means to be thirsty? You know, we live in America. There's water everywhere. Just go to the faucet, turn it on. It's 
stuck at stuff at the quick shop. You can get a drink so many places. Do we even know what it means to be thirsty? But God says, If you are thirsty for me, God says, If you are thirsty for me, I will pour water upon you. Do you believe that, young people? Oh, put that promise to God's test this week. Because God promises He will do it. God promises, I will, I will pour my Spirit upon you. And then we also see in these verses the power that comes out of that promise. Because it also influences other people. Other people. How does this work? In the home, I would like to illustrate that here this morning, how that works. And I'm going to use my two buddies to help me illustrate it. Why don't you boys come up here for a minute, huh? I want to show you how this whole thing works. How does this work? God says, He who's thirsty, don't laugh, you'll miss it. You'll miss it. This is one of the most awesome principles in your home life, and I don't want you to miss it. God says, When you're thirsty, I will pour my spirit upon you. And I will also pour my spirit upon thy seed. And my blessing upon thine offspring. When? When you are thirsty, God says. So here we come with an empty vessel. A dry vessel. A vessel that is thirsty. And God says, I promise you, as you are thirsty for me, I will pour water upon you. How does this work? God begins to pour into that thirsty vessel a drink from his spirit. And what happens as God does that? Hmm? What happens as God does that? I can just hardly keep this glass from just spilling over because it's so full. And you see, God didn't say, I'll give you a drink if you're thirsty. He said, I will dump a bucket on you if you're thirsty. You won't be able to contain it all. And it will splash out of your life and onto their life. Mercy drops round us are falling, said the little boy and the little girl that lived in that home. Where the Papa and the Mama were dedicated to God. Mercy drops round us were falling all the days of our life. You boys can go sit down. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Look at the beautiful promise that is mentioned here in Verse 4, concerning our children, young people. Concerning our children. It says of those children who live in that house where that water just keeps running over. They shall be, they shall spring up 
as among the grass. They shall spring up as willows by the watercourse. Now what God is saying by this, and it's talking about our children, young people, long before they ever get converted, they will spring up like willows by the watercourse. The picture there is a picture of, of, a, of, a, of a little river, or maybe a creek that's going by, and, and there are these willow trees there, and we all know what happens to the willow trees that are planted right next to the watercourse. We all know it. Oh, they spring up. They grow so much faster than the other trees. Why? Because there's this river that just keeps flowing by. I mean, day in and day out. And day in and day out, this river just keeps flowing by. And God says to us, young people, if you're thirsty for me, I will dump a bucket of water upon you, upon your life, in your heart. You won't be able to contain it. It will splash out of your life. And those children which live in your house, who are around you more than anybody else, those children will be planted by a river of water that just keeps on flowing day after day after day that river is flowing because the papa and the mama have been filled with the Spirit of God. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 says to us, all of us as Christians, be being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be being continually filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Mercy drops round us are falling. Mercy drops fall on these precious children. And young people, you are the water course that they are planted by. You, your life is the water course. Can you see the many generation foundation that is coming forth here as we look at these principles, all of them working together? The vision we spoke about on Monday, the beautiful dedicated life that we spoke about yesterday, and all how these things fit together, can you see, young people, the many generation foundation that can be laid? Hudson Taylor's home was a home like that. If I were to pick a home in living reality and history, like the home that I'm trying to describe to you this morning, I would have to say that Hudson Taylor, the founder of the China Inland Mission, lived in a home like that. Both of his parents received a blessing from their heritage. Both of his parents pursued their own blessing. Before they ever got married, they were sold out to God. Both of his parents as they were married, they came together in holy matrimony with a pure courtship and the blessing of their parents and their churches upon their union. They found themselves with child and an awe settled over them as they realized, we're going to have a baby. And Hudson Taylor's father was reading in the Scriptures one day, and he was gripped with the truth there in the Scriptures that the firstborn belongs to God. He was reading there in the Old Testament, and, and I personally believe that's the Old Testament. They all belong to God in the New Testament. But he saw that principle in the Bible, and he drew his dear wife near to him and said, Look, honey, look what God is saying to me here this morning. What do you think? And she said, You're right. You're right, dear. This one 
belongs to God. And they got down on their knees together and they dedicated that child, though it was still in the womb, and said, God, this one is for you. You can do with him or her whatever you want. They saw the value of a child and their home was a holy atmosphere. It was a holy atmosphere. Little James Hudson Taylor grew up with mercy drops falling all around him all of his days in his home. And it was six years old when he looked up to his daddy and said, Daddy, I'll go to China. I'll go to China. When I get big... I'll go to China. There was a holy atmosphere in that home. They had a vision. They had a vision. A purposeful vision to raise a soldier for their king. They did. You study it. Fifty pages in Hudson Taylor's two volume set on the growth of a soul. And the growth of a mission. You study it 50 pages on his home life. I hope you will study it. They had a vision. There they with much purpose. Both of them were skilled in this holy art of training children. And they did it. They dwelt in unity and love. And there was never an argument in the home. And they practiced dozens and dozens of these methods with a clear goal in mind. They raised that boy on purpose. And God picked up their son and used him to do great damage to Satan's kingdom and to gather many souls around the throne that we've been hearing about this week. God did that. I'm just going to keep going here a few more minutes. Beloved young people, this is the way that God wants you to view your union as husband and wife. This is the way that God wants you to view the offspring of that union. This is the view that God wants you to have concerning the home that you established. A training ground for soldiers for my king. See, you, you understand, young people, it's so much more than just, oh, we're going to get married, won't it be nice, and we're going to have a baby, and we're going to play house. Oh, it's way, way more than that, young people. It's one of the most awesome things that you could ever enter into, but it's one of the most exciting and rewarding. If you will follow God's plan, it is very exciting. You see, God wants you to raise up disciples in your home to make your children the disciples of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the goal. To make a disciple of your child, a disciple of Jesus Christ, who loves Him, who serves Him, who walks with Him, whose very heart beats for Him, that's the goal. I was thinking about the Lord Jesus and His disciples and how He poured His life into eleven. And it's true. He preached sermons. He healed people. He ministered here and there. He had a lot of things going on. But one thing, He never lost the focus on His disciples. He poured His life into those few disciples and after he was gone they shook the world. You know, I was thinking about that with my own children. I have eight so far. 
I have eight. Eight disciples. Do you suppose, young people, that if I spent my whole life raising eight disciples who would all go out and do damage to Satan's kingdom and gather around the throne some of that multitude, do you suppose I will have wasted my life? You know, I have many opportunities. There are many crying voices. There's lots of work to do. I could go 15, 16 hours a day until I drop and I wouldn't get all finished with all the opportunities that are knocking at my door. But you know something else? I have eight disciples at my home that are going to work for God when I'm gone. And I've gotten that one figured out. And so I may not preach as many sermons in my lifetime, but somebody else is going to preach some after I'm gone. And I may not win as many souls as somebody else, but someone else is going to win them after I'm gone. Because I have eight souls at home who need to be made into disciples. Do you understand, young people? You see, we're not just putting in time. This is a training camp. This whole thing is a training camp. What about missions? Just, just a moment and I'll be done. What about missions? Our brother Daryl has been challenging our hearts about missions, and maybe you've been sitting there thinking, oh, how does a home fit into any of this? Well, let me just broaden your perspective a bit. Do you remember the Moravians and their missions? In the heat of the revival of Moravian missions, Ten percent of the Moravian church went off to the mission field. Ten percent. And the rest of them that were back home, everybody's heart beat with the same beat for the lost souls of the world. The ones that were at home, what were they doing? Working to give to the ones who went out on the field, praying for the ones that were out on the field, seeking to find out what's happening out on the field, preparing that maybe I'll be the next one who gets to go, not have to go, I, maybe I'll get to go, I'm going to prepare myself. What do you think the Moravian fathers and mothers were doing with their children? With that kind of an atmosphere and an attitude among them, what do you think those fathers and mothers were doing? You know the answer. They were raising soldiers for the king. That's what they were doing. With that in mind, that's the thing. That's the thing. You know, it's, I don't remember, but it was a few years ago that I preached a few lessons on missions at a Bible school. And I was amazed. I thought, how can I fire all these young people up about missions and not give them something to do to prepare? So I gave them something to do to prepare, and I was shocked how many of them took me up on it. Go home and study the Perspectives course. That's a book, 800 pages thick. It took Daniel two and a half months, eight hours a day for two and a half months to get from page one to page 800. He lived in the prayer shack for two and a half months there at our house and just studied Perspectives. I gave him that. I told him, 
You get the two volume set by Hudson Taylor and you read that and make notes as you read it. That's another 600 some pages and they devoured them. And I said, you get Explore the Book by J. Sidlow Baxter, and which is an Old and New Testament survey of the Bible. You study that. That's another 800 pages and two times through the Bible to finish that. And then I told him, you engraft the Sermon on the Mount in your heart and your life. You do those things in preparation for maybe going to a mission field somewhere. And I was amazed how many of them took me up on it. Maybe we need to get, get to preparing for our homes like that. Maybe, maybe we need to wake up a bit there too, you know. Is one more important than the other? Oh, one's much more adventurous and, and, and romantic than the other. It makes many good stories. It makes your heart stir when you hear the stories. But shouldn't we be preparing for the other also, since most of you will probably get married in the next five or six years? I think we do wisely if we engage our hearts with a mindset to prepare. With purpose, with vision, and with the eye of our hearts. Fixed upon God, we need to prepare because before you know it, you may be sitting in an auditorium somewhere and it will be your wedding day. I want you to prepare, young people. I want you to have a godly home. I want you to raise up a generation of children that will pass you up. That's what I want. And that's what God wants. Shall we stand together for prayer? And let's all just pray together from our hearts. From our hearts. Not out loud, but just from your heart. You pray. As I pray. Oh, Father, we bow to Thee at the end of this session, God. And how our hearts long for you to write this deeply upon our heart. God, I want to see. I want to see. Open my eyes that I may see. Oh God, we pray for all the children. Lord, all the little boys and all the little girls. That shall come someday from these young people. I pray a holy atmosphere for all of those children. May they come into the world and sense the presence of God coming from their father and their mothers. In